Stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Okay, so tonight we have a workshop meeting where we have two items on our agenda and we don't have any additional items to add, right? The clerk's office didn't have anything that we needed to add. So we're going to discuss from now until 6.30 um, NBR rezoning related topics. And then starting at 6.30 we have a presentation from Russell Urban Mead who the village has retained to investigate groundwater options in our community. So, you know, I, I just want to re-emphasize that no one meeting will uh, determine anything. You know, the idea is that we want to have a thorough process where we get input from the community, uh, input amongst our board members, and we can digest the, the uh, suggestions from the NBR committee. So this is a discussion. It was very tricky to work out all of our schedules this time of year. So last week we discussed getting together at this time, which is before our joint meeting, which starts at 7.30 this evening. Um, so the idea was just to get us all in the same room at the same time, continue this conversation just so we don't lose any momentum as we try to uh, move forward with the, the rezoning work regarding the NBR. Um, so I, we have a, several people here. If anyone was interested in making a public comment, we, we could start off with that. Does anyone want to share a thought or just let us jump right in? Alan, you wanted to come on up and, and use a mic. One is, can you explain the difference? Hold on, hold on, wait until, otherwise the video is not capturing what you're oh. saying. <laughs> Great loss. Um, can you explain what the difference is between the MUR, mixed use residential, and NBR? Uh, I think the MUR was um, a, a name change suggested by the NBR committee. I understand, but what's the difference between the two things? Is what's the substantive difference? Um, I'm not sure. Do they? I'm, do well, they? Well, basically, it's north south, and they were making the case that the southern um, parcels should be in a different zone with different rules than the parcels in the northern part of the okay. current NBR. Do both of them keep the required connection between some commercial and some residential in the same structures, or does that change? Yeah, there's no difference there. There's no difference. That's what yeah, I wanted the, the to know. Yeah, the big, broad concepts are all the same. That's Between the old NBR, the new NBR, the proposed I, MUR, I the big, broad concepts are the same. same. It's Thank the, you. It's the, 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 the refined details that that are different and that's what thank you discussing. very much part of the thinking was that the lots in the large in the northern zone are larger so they may be able to support more of the build out than some of the other lots so the committee had suggested there be two different zones so that way we could that find part, ways I, to I, that part I understood zones apply in each and and then the second thing is just will you take written comments mm -hmm. from people still and do you know for how long well We'll absolutely take written okay. comments. Um, so also part of this process is once we have a draft law, we'll then hold public hearings on that draft law. Very good. Thank you. We're, we're not even at that stage yet. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify. Thanks, Alan. Do you want to come, come and use the mic? I like having business in the village. So much of the business, you know that beyond Mannheim, there was never any business. It was all in the village, and it's all moving into the town. And the question is, on our street, we like to have businesses. So for example, Stewart's would like to come over on the other side and build a bigger place. 
uh, the post office wants to move up there onto our street. They can't hear you, they're yeah, saying. Yeah. Okay. I'm saying that. Yeah, do the oh, mic so, so everybody the, can um, hear. The okay. prop in the other door to partially close the door to the kitchen, that helps a lot. North, North Chestnut was a business street. And I, I've always liked the idea that business was in the village. And up until um, many years ago, there were no businesses in the town. They were all in the village. They got moved up Main Street into the town. They took t businesses out of the village. Now on our street, which is a business street, uh, Stewart's for example. you say our street, you mean? North Chestnut. Okay. North Chestnut is, is an all business street. The question is, if it's all going to be apartments with tiny little businesses underneath, like the ones we have on Main Street, which are mainly restaurants and uh, selling little uh, 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 charms and things like that, uh, which isn't really very useful. Uh, it would not be nice to have continue to be a business street. And as I said, uh, Stewart's would like to become larger. And it's a wonderful, wonderful business. As I said, the post office uh, says it doesn't have enough room. It wants to move further on North Chestnut. Uh, there are a number of businesses. The uh, hardware store wanted to be on our street. And I would like North Chestnut to continue to have good, strong businesses not just have houses with tiny little unimportant businesses. And lots of restaurants. We have 40 to 50 restaurants, and I only find four or five that are even worth going to. They're pretty crummy. Thanks, Thank you. Karen. Anyone else? Is this the last um, You're more than welcome to comment yeah. now or in the future. If you want to make a comment, you got to come up to the mic. Great. Hey, guys. Hi. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Richard Cassano. I live on 151 through 32 North in the district. Um, I've been a part of the whole concept of the rezoning for many, many years now, since 2005. And I kind of agree, you know, there's, um, there's some flexibility into how, I guess, you could lay out the retail. You know, there was originally in the initial code it was supposed to be all the first floor was retail which obviously didn't work so we had to concentrate on moving it towards the, the frontage to make it you know no. uh, on, on a scalable project it only made sense that you couldn't create the whole first floor in retail but maybe there could be a little forgiveness for some size you know, if a department store or pharmacy or something that wanted to come in, could come in. Um, however, the, um, the problems I think that we were all running into in, in a division of the, the zones was to try and revert back to an initial zone, which was taken out of effect roughly about 10 years ago, the B3 district. So if the B3 district goes back into effect, what that essentially does is it cuts off any conversation with the board, the community, for any development to take place in the Northern Gateway, which was originally the concept of development for the Northern section, it really wasn't for the Southern section. Um, and then you, there's a there's this holding pattern that could just sit there forever and ever. Whereas if the the board would um, consider keeping everything in the same zone, as I would recommend, the um, potential for having people that would be looking to develop into this community to sit down and figure out a solution to a problem that is a problem that everybody knows about. Um, it just leaves it more transparent and open for that solution to become a reality. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was that um, in the inception of the whole concept, I believe, of this rezoning into a mixed-use 
corridor. There was three major factors. There was one factor that was there's a zero percent occupancy rate in New Paltz right now in terms of rentals. A lot of the rentals are substandard. The, the community as a whole was invited through all these things back in 2005 with Behan and we all made it very clear that um, there was a necessity for new. Transition from the old into the new, same price point. It would give a shift. It would force some of the substandard apartments in this community to be upgraded and therefore either have to lower their rent, just put more supply in there, and then you know you could actually get them to move and shuffle around. The other thing was they did studies on the infrastructure of the sprawl and spreading out into the vistas and our natural resources, which we are a touristy town. Everybody knows that we thrive and survive on people coming up to visit us. So like a, a good example would be like the Rivendell Winery. They were fought hard because it was going to take out one of the main vistas of your approach to the mountain. So, and the, the cost to maintain the infrastructure once it's put in is another counter effect that would counter, you know, um, prohibit moving out into the thing. So the village had decided um, on good recommendations to densify within the core where you have water, sewer, and your, in your main, your main core. Um, and lastly, as you all know, um, this was also part of a, you know, of a, I guess a campaign to try to bring more business into the area. Whether or not you limit it to 2,500 square feet per retail unit, you know, that's kind of up to the board as to what flexibility you would give towards the size or the, the uh, composition of how you break up the retail. But, you know, if, if it's all 2,500 square feet, maybe you struggle with getting a little grocery store coming in there or some something a little bigger that can supply um, you know to the people that live there the grocery store has all kinds of amenities um, and, that, and that again brings me to one last point is that having densification in a zone where you have public transportation, you have pedestrian friendly access, and you also have access to the rail trail. So you've got three things that, are, that make it much less a necessity to have a vehicle. Um, it's been kind of tested by the people that originally did the traffic studies that you know, where you have public transportation, now you've got UCAT, you have trailways, you've got the loop bus, they all pick up right in front on 32. I could stop them at any time up in the northern section and they'll stop and pull over and get a ride in town, go to college, go to the Poughkeepsie train station, wherever you need to go. Um, so you kind of have all the, the, the triple things there. And, and now you got natural gas because it just, Put it all in there. Um, if I could recommend to the board to keep the northern portion out of the B3 and going back in progress to move forward towards a better community for the village, that would be my suggestion. And I thank you all for your time. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Rich. Okay, anyone else before we? start walking through this thing no okay KT I'll let you take okay it from here. cool so um, board members what I gave you is the first one which is a lot easier to read is a cleaner version um, of the working draft that Tim and I have been um, trying to get us up to date so that we have a current document 
it still, still has a bunch of comments in there. Um, it, it has um, notations for the items that generated the most discussion in the first workshop, um, and also just a couple of my questions and notes from that workshop. Um, the track changes got so messy, as many of us that work with these kind of documents know, at some point you hit a threshold and you can't really read what you're doing. So I also gave you, if you want to go back to the original, I did a compare docs with all the track changes starting from zero. Um, and that's a much longer one where you can see every single change. But I wanted you to have um, a clean copy that we could go through that's current, but also a historical record of where we've been before in case you get to a section and you're like, wait, it didn't look like this before. What did it used to look like? So now you have everything in front of you. So does this document represent what we, talk, what we all talked about, or it's updated since our last discussion? It's updated since our last discussion. Just for the first time. Uh, dude, I do it as fast as I can. <laughs> um, but it should Don, make sure you have it a mic. Why don't you guys it give that mic to Don? And then it shouldn't be one. anything new. It should just be a document that reflects conversations we've that, Michael, already please. had before. Um, and um, with lots of notations, as you can see, about the ongoing um, things that we've been paying attention to. Um, and. That provides a segue. So the list of things that I had, um, but before I say that, let me just say, does everybody agree that we could operate the way we did at the first workshop, which is pretty fluid, where if people want to chime in and help us sort things out, that's OK? I would prefer it if we allow people to provide their input, absolutely. OK, so same MO as last time? I just point out that if you're using that document, I don't know what's happening. Yeah, that's, yeah and we just saw it. Most of us just literally got it. It's the same. It's, it's, it's it the is original, that document it's the with notations of what happened at code. the last meeting. It's just in just black and white. Of, well, you don't understand that. No, yep. We don't have it. Yep. Um, so the items that generated the most discussion at the first workshop were roof decks, access to rail trail, the north south um, differentiation, which we heard a little bit about just now from a couple people. Um, building height, design standards, and parking space specifications. So we could go through that list. Why don't we and just talk go, through that, go through that list? I mean, the, the, the idea that it feels daunting that you're looking at these changes, I mean, these are mostly just basic edits that are, are not. Yeah. It's nothing not, new. They don't need to really be deliberated on there. It's not new. It's supposed to just be a snapshot I, of I where we that, are right that now. The list you just provided are the key concepts that we need to discuss as a board. So why don't we start with those? Okay. So, um, roof decks. So, if you go to the section on roof decks, for example, I plucked in the stuff that you had suggested, Don. Um, where in, is the section on comment. roof decks? And that is on the bottom of page two. So I think, wait, yeah. So are we now talking about roof decks? Yes. Yes, we're talking about roof decks. Okay. And um, just for the benefit of the people who don't have this document and weren't at the last uh, board meeting, um, uh, Bill and I have spoken offline and come up with the uh, following compromise. I happen to be personally opposed to roof decks, but we're trying to compromise and, and kind of get something that people can all live with, even if they don't jump up and down with with joy and excitement. So the uh, proposals were uh, no lighting or electrical outlets on a roof deck. Uh, if electrical outlets or lighting are required by code, uh, they should be knee high and no higher. That uh, the hours of operation for roof decks would be dawn to dusk. There would be a transparent sound barrier around the perimeter, specifically the edges facing residential housing. So if you can think of clear plexiglass or whatever other noise dampening uh, material is used for that sort of thing. 
Um, I was looking to require grass roofs, but we can't, we agreed on uh, grass roofs as a uh, stated preference for uh, rooftop decks in the code. No barbecues or smoking on a roof deck, and uh, I have yet to we have let yet to have a definitive answer on whether secondary egress would be required, a, a second exit. Yeah. You know. Well, that's a question for the housing uh, or the building department. Did you guys ask Brian that question? Uh, I have not yet. I think I emailed him. There was an important question I wanted to ask him. Could you please get back to me? And we've missed each other, so this hasn't happened. We're just talking about roof decks right now. Correct. Yeah, I'm saying that like, if, if you want to encapsulate it, make it noise pattern proof, would there be a distance that would be? Yeah, there'll be side yard requirements and rear yard requirements. Yes. From other residential. People. I'm confused. From just other property for the lines. Roof deck? Are you talking about if it juts out or? I'm saying like if you don't have, if you want to put something up in the front of your property. Oh, you're saying like a balcony facing east if you're on the west side of the street. Correct. Yeah. Or, or west, but what would be a recommended, you know, distance away from another residential house that would make you have to go and put up sound barriers? So, uh, were we, I wasn't even thinking of it as something jutting, for lack of a better word, out of the building. I was just thinking of roof decks as the deck on top of the building. Well, maybe you can yeah. even frame it. Like, I think Rich's question is, like, let's say you had a, a rectangle and you only had half of the rectangle as the roof deck and then the back half. So that essentially becomes a barrier because half of the roof is not used for outdoor and so under oh, so have no that. neighbors for other than commercial for you know for the yards. Or facing the street, facing thirty two. Yes, right. So sort of in line with last time how we thought maybe portions of the roof could be green, so maybe like the back part could be green and also maybe like a barrier like you we were talking about. Um, or you could say, I'm just brainstorming aloud, like only the front half of the building could be used as a roof deck. Yeah, we call, could also call Facing out. Facing 32. Right. Could also call out uh, <clears throat> size as well in terms of percentage of the roof surface itself. And I guess one of the questions brought to mind for the first time, could a roof deck actually extend beyond the other beyond the, the like dimensions cantilever of the, over the building. building. Yeah, and I, I would sure like to make sure that that wouldn't happen, and I think that's yeah, But even just structurally, it, it can't jut out more than a few feet. Right, but we're not talking about balconies or things that jut out at lower levels or even four. We're talking about in this, well, just... I, I think what Don's talking saying about is a roof deck that cantilevers over the main building, so that right. the roof deck is larger. Yeah, and no, I think that's something that we might want to talk about and specify because I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to see that. And we haven't talked at all about balconies and other types of decks. We've only no. talked about. But in the context the roof. of roof decks, I would right. want to make sure I limit them to the dimensions of the outer building. Rich's scenario does uh, oh, go, raise go ahead, an interesting sorry. point in that you know instead of saying that it has to be around the perimeter specifically facing residential houses, perhaps we just say that the barrier has to be on any side that faces another residential house because if your building is blocking it you shouldn't have to put a sound barrier on top of that as well you know, i think it's just a matter of nailing down the verbiage that we have the intent of looking for you were going to add something brad yeah uh question um one of the things that i think we haven't done well enough is define what are what is the use that we're talking about for the roof deck I mean, in almost any commercial building, it's regulated based on usable floor space for specific use. 
That's what all your amenities are based on. That's what your parking, traffic, blah, blah, blah. It's all based on that. So if the roof decks have been pitched partially as an, an amenity for the residents to use as a common area, an exercise area, yoga classes. You like you remember my yoga classes. Thank uh, you. Well, no, Mr. Shepler does yoga classes constantly. So. Uh, okay, sorry, um, I didn't steal that from him no. on purpose. <laughs> Again, my thought is, if that's just common area, the impacts probably can be limited. But if the if the use is such that it allows people to reserve it for events parties, group parties, then the impacts could be much more severe. And so I think partially divining what is the use of allowable use for roof then. Mm -hmm. Again, if it's common area, then we really have very few impacts and we really have um, no additional requirements as far as it's for the residents to yep. use, if they invite one or two people. You know, at one part of, again, the only thing I can reference is Mr. Shepler's stuff. So, in one part of his uh, screening uh, of roof terrace, he talked about, well, the resident would have to make sure that there were going to be 30 additional parking spaces in the parking lot available for when he had his party on the roof deck. And, you know, to me, 30 additional cars were the people. That's an event. That's not, you know, a common open space use. I think what you're bringing up is is a really good suggestion. I, I think first of all we can say the roof deck use is restricted to the residential, uh, you, know, you know, folks in the building. It's not going to be used by any of the commercial space. That's step that's, one. That's a great condition that's to start. With. Step one, that's and great. then step two. Question: But if, let's say, I have a resident. I decide I don't want to invite a bunch of people over. Well, that's where we're going. I'm a resident, but I want to have another bunch of people who are relatives or what have you. I want to have a big event. Right. That's so, where we're going so I think this is where Brad was suggesting is that that the second condition would be that it's for individual unit use, um, but as building policy, you can't reserve the 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 roof deck for any party or event space. Like I used to live in an apartment building and you could reserve the downstairs common space and have a kid's birthday party. We could have a restriction that says the roof deck is only for individual tenant enjoyment. Common. You can't rent common it, area. you can't rent it out for any events. So I, I think that to me I'm fine with that. That does a lot with eliminating the yeah. impacts, you know, and again, uh, uh, some of the sound barrier stuff, I think, maybe I don't even, I'm not even sure we need if we, if it's limited to common area. I don't even think it would necessarily work, uh, like if you actually had a ladder party. Um, and then I think it's no longer an outdoor space when it's screened in with sound barriers. It's also, I think. It's not really fair to the tenants. The idea is that you, the idea is that it's an amenity for the tenants so they have some access to outdoor space. And we have to remember we're talking about this on uh, a series of buildings all the way along the street. So we could have 10 roof decks in a row. And you know, if we have competing parties every weekend, that's a different situation than the common area for yoga classes or exercise classes or you know, going up and looking at the stars. Um, I, I, I think you want to encourage people to come home after work and, and go sit in their roof deck and, and decompress. I think that's a nice a nice amenity to have in an apartment building. I, I totally agree. I totally I, agree. I have a question. The distinction, you said right about, but let's say I as an individual live in the apartment. I'm not going to rent it, but I want to bring a bunch of my friends up there. I'm not, I'm not renting it. I'm just bringing a bunch of friends up. I differentiate between, again, for me, the differentiation would be if I reserve the roof deck, if, I can, if each resident is allowed to reserve the roof deck so many times, 
to have their own private party, then that's not common space. If common space, it always must be available, available. to everyone. There can never be a time where it's restricted sure. space. It always has to be available to every tenant. And if you do that, I think you know we're a long way down the road. I mean, I, I like that concept. I think that if you were going to make it for tenants use only and no parties and stuff like that, or no crazy, you know upstairs commercial bar looking over the mountain or anything, then maybe you should consider leaving more of the roof space available because in some of these smaller projects that are taking place, they don't have a lot of room to get back into um, the land surrounding once you have the parking. And if you were to create gardens or, you know, some type of amenities that people could do, you know, even if there was a, a communal type of a bar. And if we're honest, if it's on the ground and you're having retail and a common open public area on the ground, it's not really private space for the residents. So, you know, a roof that can serve that function, but in a common area type arrangement. Sounds good. What do you guys think? I see only one possibility, and maybe remote, but if, if a group of people in the, in the residence get together four or five and say, we're going to get together and have a party on this roof down. So then you're looking at a considerable amount of people on the roof terrace or on the roof deck at one time having a party. So how would you manage, what's the recommendation to manage that? Well, I think the level that the party can get wild it's going to be a lot less if they can't keep anyone else. I mean, if all the residents can go up on the roof at any time, then if you're having your dinner party up there, I don't think you're going to get, you know, naked and crazy. If any of the other residents can come up at the same time. So what if, I'm sorry, what if, you know, 20 people from the building decide they want to have a party together? Yeah, they can. They can, based on what we're describing. Right, and they happen to invite two or three friends each. And so, but again, what's, what's the else? likelihood of that occurring I don't every know. weekend? I, I'm just yeah. posing a... It depends on who lives there. And the fact that we're requiring a special use permit does give us the ability to go back if after we do that. a year. That's still just a proposal. Right, but that's in the current uh, draft that you just mm -hmm. passed around. Mm -hmm. So if the special use permit does give us the ability, if people are going outside of the intentions that we're looking for, to go back and rescind their, their rooftop access. But I just want to go back, because uh, we keep talking about everyone giving everyone access at the same time. If a building is large enough, the maximum occupancy of the roof may not support the number of people that live in the building at any one time. So we may not be able to just say everyone has to have access to it at all times because there may be more people that actually can access it at any given but time. But I think that's safe. You, up to, we just have to ensure that we you're stay still up to the maximum office. You're never going to get around code, and code is going to tell you right drops. on the top. Yeah. Hey, when you enter the room or the, the jack, it's going to say X number of people have for a fire phone. Right, I'm just saying. If we're saying that everyone has to have access, we have to include up to the maximum. Right. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's okay. a good addition. Uh, Neil, you were going to add something? Yes. Aren't there already village uh, noise ordinance that would address this? And yeah. Why, would, why not just update the noise ordinance to help out? We already did that. Other, yeah. other yeah. aspects of the village. We, We've been there. This, this, happens, this happens all the time. This isn't going to be the first time where there's a student center of too noisy. Right? And my neighbors, your neighbors, this happens everywhere else in the village, and we deal with it. Right? It's too noisy, call the police, and then they break up the party. Yeah. Uh, may I, may I, may I respond to that? I used to live on South Chestnut. Called the police when it was a problem. Yeah. 15 minutes later, the party started again. It doesn't work. And we, and well, I when, when, I assumed, when I assumed as mayor, we had a noise, we worked on noise ordinance, we worked on noise ordinance, and it's so difficult enforce and it's so frustrating for neighbors to have to call the police every time there's problems. We updated the noise ordinance, Tom, so the, the property owner can be held accountable for those repeat offenses. We broke the windows and police did not come. Police did not come. 
that, that is my biggest concern is enforcement. Because my experience over 30 years that in the area with student housing was the police would come and they would go and the party would start again. You call again, the police come. I never saw anybody arrested. They were admonished. Uh, it's unless somehow you could really enforce these ordinances, you're just creating a problem for those of us who are residents. Yeah. I mean, I live right next door to college housing. SUNY New Paltz is a lot better as far as uh, its school's reputation than it was 30 years ago. No, there's all the other, all the other campuses do not have, they all have dorms. New Paltz was not from many dorms, but all the other campuses do not have people living off outside of dorms. Well, I, am, I was a, a faculty member for, for 20 years, which meant I went to meetings at every single campus. And they did not have place students living off campus. I, I really like this compromise, yeah, this yeah. idea of um, differentiating between common area versus events, because I, I feel very strongly that, um, and I, I think Richie, you alluded to this in, you know, when you were speaking, I mean, the whole intent here is to create housing that's attractive to um, middle income tenants that are young professionals or pre-retirement or newly downsizing, which I hope to be when my last child leaves to go to college. And I think a roof deck um, to just cut that off. Um, you know, people who are um, highly resourced enough to buy a house get a backyard. I think people whose resources put them in a place where uh, an apartment and an apartment building is what they can afford, that we want them to have something similar, right? A roof, a roof deck that they can go to for some um, semi-private space. So thank you, Brad. I really yeah, like I how you did that. The nuts and bolts, right? So, so Brad's addition of the roof must always be open for common use. And then Dennis's additional condition, however, up you maximum. up to the maximum allowable occupancy. I think with those two things, and, and then the initial that the, the roof decks are only available for the residential tenants as opposed to the commercial uh, tenants. A lot for me yeah. as far as making it acceptable. I think the green roofs is a good idea. I, I am concerned a little bit about with requiring grass that, that you can't have solar. So I, I like the solar energy on a lot of roofs. So I, I, I don't want to limit that. Yeah, it's encouraged enough for Kara? Encouraged is good. Yeah, Hold encouraged. On. I, I disagree. I really like the idea of being able to come home to a space and sitting outside. Well, what what sort of timing would you feel good about? No, I'd start right now. So, what sort of timing do you think would be effective in a college town? You want people out there at two o'clock in the morning making noise? I wouldn't be making well, noise at two o'clock in the morning. I, can we micromanage off? that from the this from this far away? Because it's four stories up and over a bunch of residential people. Backyards are not do not have that condition. And noise projects. I, I could not, it I cannot imagine bad. for one second times, that we would tell someone that you cannot be outside after yeah. a certain yeah. hour. It's such an overreach. I would feel so uncomfortable if our planning board ever told anyone that they cannot go outside. The only thing I would say is, you know, the reality is, that even if it was hours dawn and dusk and you wanted to go out and look at the stars at night, you prop the door open and it was going to know. I don't think it's for us to say. I, I don't like the idea of putting things in our code that sets our building department up for failure. That's impossible to enforce. Well, I would say given the, the consistent comment we've heard over a long period of time, uh, it is for us to say it's a very large concern with regard to this zone. Um, a lot of the people who are here have been here again and again and again. They'll be directly affected by it, and it seems to be a very important issue. So. Well, what we're looking here is for a compromise. Right. I'm not, not trying to sidestep. Um, I think 
and um, I think within the and we run into this we have a couple projects in planning board now where they're under special use permits so we're trying to figure out figure out exactly how we navigate that like how much is it directive but what it does is that it offers this mechanism that it needs to be annually revisited right so it doesn't specifically I, I would recommend not specifically saying you know you can only be there at a certain amount of time but because of the concerns raised by people in the community about noise um, if we have a special use permit for roof tops then we have a mechanism for going back in and saying hey you you know this was allowed and this is not allowed anymore because you abuse it um, which is you know I think the best that we can and should do if we go with the special use permit most likely you'll know, probably manage on the site that can hear what's going on and kind of blow the whistle if they have to. But you know, again, it's up to the tenants as well to, you know, look at what they are signing on the dotted line to agree to the terms of, you know, not getting carried away outside on the roof. Right. We forget in these conversations as well, and we don't have crystal balls that building owners and managers also are incentivized to make sure that the environment is good for everyone living in that building. And they won't want things that are disruptive to the other people that are living in the building as well. That's what I was just gonna say, like, imagine the other people in the building, they're expecting that there are gonna be, you know, a wide range of ages of people, the older people, and they're, they're not gonna want to be able to want to put up with noise on the roof of their own building. I mean, that's, that's a consideration just as much. So I think, I tend to agree with if it's going to be revisited, let's just see what happens. What do you think, Bill? Well, I like the idea of the common use area. I think that's a great, great suggestion. Uh, and it would eliminate some of these things we're calling out, these specifics, which could be included in the special use permit, if, if necessary, if that's what we want to do. Um, I'm a bit more pessimistic in terms of cooperation when it comes to a roof deck. I think, uh, I think once you have an outdoor space like that, you know it's there. Yes, during the day you can use it for some things, and then at night it's very tempting to have a party there. So, and not that people shouldn't have parties on the roof decks. I, I think that's that's something that can happen, but it's what level of that party and how much noise they're making. But I think uh, I, what I really would like to talk about is the size of these roof decks, um, and we really don't talk about that in any way. Um, is it going to be the entire? coverage of the roof itself? Are we asking for a percentage of the roof? Um, because size in this instance does matter. Yeah, you could do that. We could just attach a percentage of the square footage just so it doesn't end up being you know, too large of a space that then uh, attracts the, the risk of a larger party. Right. You could do that. You could say that the roof deck cannot be more than 65% of the roof square footage. And uh, further along those lines, if we are going to restrict the amount of square footage that can be used, we can then say that the portion that's not used can be facing any neighboring residential uh, projects, buildings, or whatnot. So that way there is that barrier in between. So the the space, yeah, I think that's exactly it. The space that's not being used as the roof deck should be the space in between the roof deck and a residential neighborhood. And, and I think, just one further point, I think the other thing, the other advantage of the common area is that it does give the residents some feel that that's their space. And then if another resident is abusing that space, I think they're gonna be more likely Whereas if, on the other hand, they're thinking, well, I'm having a party next week, so I can't complain about this guy's party. You're gonna be less likely to complain. So I think in some ways that <laughs> it's a planning thing, that common ownership idea helps people feel like they're protecting their own, whereas they're not willing to protect something that belongs to the public. Sure. And having worked with the park system, so I tell you that's, Tom? One of the concerns 
that I have is I've seen apartments flip. When I first moved to New Boston, there were apartment buildings that were supposed to be adults and older people. And somewhere along the line, they flipped the games to apartments. And I think even though we're talking about this as though it will be forever a uh, place for seniors to come or for older people, there's nothing to say that 10 years down the line, this part of the complex could flip, any part of the complex could flip and become a student apartment. So it seems to me that anything you have to consider needs to think, think about that. What we're trying to do differently, Tom, is we're trying to empower our building department. So we're looking to add hours of, of staff time in the building department so they can do a better job of inspecting rental properties. Because I think that has been a challenge in this community is that landlords can, can do what they want to do if, they're in, if their properties are not inspected thoroughly enough and often enough. Let's say I own an apartment complex. Finding out, getting a little bit older, it's about 10 years old now, really uh, it's no longer attracting the adults as much. I could probably make more money if I flip it over and make it student apartments, but that'll make four or five people for a market complex. And what does it stop that? It's a different business model, right? So we have some landlords in our community who choose to rent to as many college students as possible. We have other landlords in our community who try to have nicer buildings and you know there's an apartment complex in this community that has two bedroom apartments they could easily con convert every single apartment to a three three bedroom and then add significantly to the to that apartment's gross rent roll there's nothing stopping that landlord from doing that today however it's a totally different business model when you rent to students you anticipate annual turnover when you rent to students it's a whole lot more hand holding and, and so different landlords just approach the business differently. I, I so we, we, I there's always going to be that. I think current people you know, do what they expect. But what's, the, what's to say that they don't decide to sell these products five years from now? Do new landlords come in with a totally different perspective of how they're going to make money from that apartment, that apartment complex? That risk exists with every single property. So all I'm saying is that if you're planning this zoning on what you think will, will happen now, you need to also think about what could happen five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years down the line. If a new apartment owner comes in and he has a good volume. And I think we are addressing that because since this administration has been on board, we've completely overhauled our building department and added hours and empowered the folks in that building department so that they have more teeth, so that they know that we support them. The, the, the building department versus a few years ago is night and day. And we have plenty of things to do better at, but that's the hope is that if we keep supporting them and, and keep giving them staff hours, that they'll do a better job of inspecting properties, of not allowing landlords to, to just say, oh, well, I can be an absentee landlord because I don't have to stress because, you know, the, the inspection process is, you know, has no teeth. And the special use permit gives us the ability, if there is a change in the business model, to go back and correct it if someone starts abusing the privilege. The only thing that I think would be important to include with that special use permit, though, is it's not just a review. It's also enforcement conditions. You have to state in the law that you do have the ability to enforce these conditions and that you have the ability to pull a CO on that roof back if there are too many violations. Yep, yep. absolutely. You don't have to wait, you're right. You need to say enforcement, you need to state straight out what the enforcement's gonna be and what the penalties are. So it's clear and then it's not coming for review and they say, Oh, we'll do better. Yep. I oh, know. I'm sorry. You lost. You lost your privilege. Yep. So I, I think we're we, we need to move on here uh, a bit. Michael is the only person who hasn't said anything no. about roof decks. So <laughs> <laughs> I just. I have a question. University already has flat roofs, right? They have roof decks there at all? And if not, then you know maybe it would be good you to ask the university about an enforcement arm, they have a police force there. Ask them what their experience and why they don't have. Them. Because I mean, they're actually, you know, building full adults, right? They're all people in the 
norms. Um, why don't they approve that? What, what are they thinking when they do or don't allow? Well, they Imagine offer they the offer millions of dollars worth of other amenities on the campus. You're, you're comparing apples and oranges. Well, not really. We have uh, well, yeah. millions of dollars of amenities for our village. I mean, we do have parks. We have a 20 mile trail trail. We have restaurants and public spaces. There's no book preserve, micro sanctuary. Those are multi million dollars worth of resources, though. And, you know, you don't see a lot of schools. I mean, I cross the campus at night on a bike, so I don't see a lot of people walking around and enjoying those communities, wherever they are. They're in the library, but I mean, they actually have physical, physical plant in their building. So why not just ask them if they, you know, what's their experience, what's their thinking, and why they don't have them allowed? You take a dormitory for some special um, authorization where you're not allowed to have that situation going on because of how it's been set up. Mm -hmm. why not? I mean, All right, we're going to jump. So Bill wants to talk about something else. So Bill, you I, choose I the next topic. Percentage. <laughs> I just really wanted to talk a little bit about what's a workable percentage of a roof that would be, you know, allocated for a terrace, and figuring out some sort of formula if it's space or if it's by residence, or something along those lines. Is it you know ten square feet per per resident? Is it you know forty percent of the total roof? What kind of what what can we suggest in this? I was thinking it along the lines of like the lot coverage numbers, which okay. right. based on different zones kind of feel somewhat arbitrary. Right. Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not that troubled by the idea of just picking a number. And I really like the idea that, that Dennis threw out. It's like, okay, and then the non-roof deck area has to be positioned right. between. Like well. So that provides your little barrier. So make the non-roof deck area material enough that it matters. I, I'd be in favor of a uh, certain percentage per resident. That, that would be my vote. But I do also agree with you about that as a suggestion. I don't know. It feels like one of these, are we inventing a wheel here? Is there a best practice for this? That yeah, we I could, don't know. You know yeah. um, I'd also want to ask Bryant in the building department. OK. Because he deals with this on a lot level all the time. And then you got equipment you got to put up. <coughs> yeah. So there, there are other things that have to go on the roof as well. Right. Right, because the, the way the code currently reads, you can have 10% of the square footage for mechanicals. And to tell you the truth, I don't think we want all flat roofs. I mean, we don't have all flat roofs through the village. I would like to see some deep roofs. Um, and certainly we have to have a lot of like the mansard roof where the middle is. You know, again, right. the, the, we don't want to preclude other architectural styles just so everybody gets So then you gotta make that distinction too. Is yeah. the percentage of the entire available roof space or is the percentage the building's footprint? Maybe ask them a building to come Yeah, I mean I'm inclined to think available space, but I just wrote down ask Brian. I think that's a good plan. Sue was on the committee as well. And I'm just sitting up here, so maybe I'm just sitting up here. We don't make any waste. I already tried for it. I think we get a little bit back about ten minutes. Quicker progress and a little bit clearer response from the building department if we keep something out there. Well, I think now we have a bunch of good questions for Brian. So this has been a good process. We yeah. can say, Brian, what do you think about what we were wrestling with? So, but do you want to come up with a, a suggested percentage? Yeah, 60%? <coughs> what do you think of this? Do you yeah. think it should be higher or lower? You know, yeah. let's, let's throw a number out Let's throw a number out I'll say I don't think I'd be comfortable with uh, anything more than two-thirds of the footprint of the building. You know, we need to make sure that I said 65 just out of nowhere. So, yeah, that was kind of... And that's why you have 35% is a material, uh, materially large enough space to per create a barrier. I would but, think but then so, again, but I did think we should have more than 15% equipment and then 20% barrier. Yep. 65 is fun by me. So 15% equipment plus again, 20, yep, 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 plus 25% uh, non-roof deck area. That's only 16. 
Uh, yeah, ten percent is probably better, closer for equipment. So yeah, I think it is ten, 10 currently. 65. And do people have feelings on if this is of the footprint or of the available space? I'm hearing available space when you talk about these percentages. It just seems that way. Well, let's see what the code current. So when it currently talks about 10% for mechanicals, is that currently roof or mm -hmm. building footprint? Because I, I don't know the answer to that. I just know it's 10%. Because I know that there's no height restriction on that 10%. How would one roof? Operation, and then you probably have um, you know the roof would probably be rather similar to your footprint if you did a flat roof. Oh, if you did a flat roof for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But right. I'm but actually anticipating it. more peaked roofs because yeah. I think you end up with more living space square footage. Right. I think it looks more like a village. I mean, because the, the way that the way the height stuff that we've started suggesting is. Well, 35, 35, uh, no, I guess it's like 40 foot max, three stories. So that encourages you to have like upstairs that are in a peaked roof. So you get more living space that way. Otherwise, you have to just build to 35, I think. Yeah. All right, what was the, let's, let's move on from roof decks. Well, so we have some questions for Brian. Yes. So um, at the very beginning of God's intention of compromise in no light on the rooftop deck, I would like to know if there could be some sort of restrictions on the intensity of the light or the direction of the light. I think actually Don's language was really good where it said the lights can't be above uh, knee level, right? That was actually Bill's language. Yeah. So that, that works, I think, really well. No lighting above, well, make sure, let's make sure we add yeah. that. Knee high lights, like socks. Knee and no outlet. I don't know about that outlet thing. That doesn't seem, it, that has Well, that means, it. means no boom boxes. I mean, yeah, but it also back means to the 1970s. Other things All, that Also means need. people can't stare at their phones, either. <laughs> Look, getting people to stop doing that. Right. Okay, so the next item, and I don't know how much we need to talk about this one. It was this one that generated discussion was the issue of rail trail access, and whether or not we were. I think, I think we are. So maybe with a, a straw poll, are we all just good with the? Needs what? to be special use permit. No, you know what I would add to that. I what think page you on? I got. I'm still finding it. I think we could also actually identify, like let's say between um, Broadhead and Mulberry. Um, you you could have rail trail access um, from just one side by special use permit, but um, we should have like a cap. Like you cannot have. And I'm just making this up. Between those two sections, you cannot have more than two rail trail access points. Like you don't want to have a situation where there's four rail trail access points there. That's too much. So just cap it, like identify each section and say only two. So it's kind of like first come, serve, first serve. Like if your building gets approval from the planning board by a special use permit to have a rail trail connection, you get that first one. Second guy gets the second one, and that's it. You can't have any more. I think the other thing is we're talking about requiring connection between parking lots behind the building. The stubs, yeah, I had so, that as a generated so discussion. Then everybody doesn't need their own. And I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying, yeah, not everybody needs their own because there are there's going to be engine connections um, between the sites. And so, well, that's between the sites, but with the that, that doesn't mean that each. No, I'm just saying not not everybody needs. It's kind of making a connectivity. Oh, I, I see a what you're saying. So you could go yeah, to someone else's you, site. You know, maybe we space a couple, like yeah. you said. But I think, like to Michael's point, you don't want to have every single one. You you, you don't trail need trail all these rail trail connections. Yeah, for I know you would prefer to have none, but. Well, I didn't say none. <laughs> 
but it's a question of managing the flow of people and trash. Yeah. And trash is the biggest one right now. Between Main Street and Broadhead is the filthiest section of rail trail. Like you mean miles. Mulberry and Broadhead? No, between Broadhead and Main Street. Broadhead and Main Street, yeah. Right there. The, the movement of trash is from the mobile station to behind the post office and the Jamaican restaurant, down that pathway across the town and country, from town and country, and then it goes to the Huguenot, uh, the Guards of Nutrition, follows down the river. You, you can just follow the trash. I mean, it's like animal trash. Sure, right? but, but that, that's not a function of the connections to the rail trail. That's just a connection. That's a, 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 there's a direct correlation between how many people use the rail trail, rail trail and how much trash there is. Not, not There's more people who use the rail trail in that section than as you go further to the south and to the north. It's off the trail itself physically, Although, and it's much different than the, I mean, the, we can objectively find out how many people are, use the trail between Mulberry and Huguenot. And I think that's... Oh, you're thinking the properties are dumping onto the rail trail. So the people that are using uh, that well, access point. Strip I can tell you that we see less trash Right, the bridge that comes from the parking right. lot that will be from zero place since the it's fence right. went up around the zero place lot that parking lot connection and that bridge used to be a real focus of storage trash mm -hmm. you know convenience type stores where people are buying you know cones or something in a cup beer in a bag they hit the trail they're done it's gone. Yeah. So uh, there, there is some, that, that is a reason to limit some of the accesses. So I couldn't find where it was in the dock. So can you tell me what your, some language, I'm say again, the idea of not needing them on everyone and what the remedy would be right, for that. But, but so that like, let's identify between the streets, have no more than two connections between Mulberry and Broadhead, no more than two connections between Mulberry and Old Kingston, or no Huguenot, All right? Those are the those are the only rail trail sections that we're even talking about. Right, right. And then we'll Four, so two on each side, like well, two on the east side, two on the west side. The northern district, um, you, the village already has an easement across that property to make a rail trail connection. Well, I don't know about that, but yeah, it's, it's filed and deeded that, that the village has an easement. Property which I gave back in the last administration. Okay. So rail trail access. It's a uh, pretty short distance between Broadhead to you know to the next street up. To yeah. You want to yeah. limit it to one? Yeah, really. yeah. We already have one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We already have one uh, behind uh, the the old or Dressel Field. Yeah. Would it, would, it become, would it be first come, first serve, or would you have to have a permit? There are a lot of people that have made informal connections from their yards to the rail trail, so would that be the one connection that we would eliminate? No, those are guerrilla connections. We don't really, there really aren't that many of those in the NBR zone. Those are like other places. Yeah, there's a lot more um, south. But we still have to go through the walk and that the commission to get an approval to make. Yeah. So the planning In board theory, need not if you're a gorilla, though. That's the oh. new word. Not gorilla, non gorilla? Yeah. Okay. So Permitted. approved accesses. Yeah, I, I like the idea of limiting it to one, short distance. one <coughs> connection on the Quarter west mile. side and one Additional. connection on the east side. No, you're, just you're one. Between okay. Broadhead and Mulberry, and then two connections Exist. between. Existing? I would say, yeah, like you said, Dressel so Field is over Dressel the Village Pizza is really... Right, so there's your one. You have one on either side right there. That's why I've added the word additional. Yeah, there's not even... We don't I wouldn't want another one. I wouldn't want an additional one. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's you're enough. good to go there. So I, I'd say that's your existing... But those are those are essentially gorilla, probably. Right. Well, it's a pretty expensive gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. They're all the way down. Yeah, yeah, but, but the, like, <laughs> <laughs> there's probably no formal approval uh, for those I, things I, I to exist. Right. And I bet you're right. And I bet it's a violation of the of, of, of the. Seven. 
right. but also if that's that's village property it would require Walker Valley Land Trust that's approval we I, that would just the attempt would be to formalize the existing yeah I think with the little teams it just happened you know, maybe naturally maybe to I think what you need is sit down with Walter Walker Valley Real yeah I would, I would add that you know identifying just a number is not concrete enough because it, you could have in a first come first serve basis you could have two adjacent properties both apply for access and then you might have two access points that are right. 100 feet apart and it's going to be more well, expensive first i would also add that you know who offers what i mean right now there's a great potential for bosey's property to have some kind well bosey's definitely has one well yeah. it's an informal one that they don't even recognize if you ask them is that a legal well, that's well, that's our point. Is none of them, none of them are formal. They're all gorilla. But they also have a 300 car parking lot, which is a very nice thing from the railroad's point of view. That that's a public parking lot. And it, and also every single person in this room uses all of those connections. Which is which connection? The Bosey's connection, the Dressel Field connection, mm -hmm. the Village Pizza connection. Right, the SOS Kids race runs right through right. that. Right. So connection. adding additional ones, which ones you're going to add? I mean, if you if the Bosey's one is to be a connection formally, then you want to do that one. And if that bridge that's across to the current parking lot where it's a place the parking lot, you already got to. <laughs> right. So, uh, I mean, this is all super what if, but the Bosey's one we're probably all comfortable with, but. What if BOCES changed hands tomorrow and that new property owner didn't want it anymore? Well, then it opens up. Then it opens up, but... So then what happens if then you have to bid? No, then the it would be first come, first serve. It is, but it's it works really well. People use it. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Also, like, uh, you know, I, I get, uh, there's like a, a person who lives in the Bonacue View neighborhood who's regularly asking me, when are you putting in a connection from Bonacue View straight down to the rail trail? And I'm like, again, we don't have the magic money. The with the magic money. And what's the distance, though? What? I mean, it's, looking at it, what kind of distances are you talking about? No, I'm just saying, like, they're, they're, how do you, if, you, if you're at Bonacue View Road now, right. how do you get to the rail trail? You could go to Bosey's or you could go to Mulberry. Those are the right. only two ways right. to get to the rail trail. And, and if their objective is to get on a 22 mile trail, walking an extra, what, 300 feet? 500 feet? I didn't say their request was reasonable. Pardon me? I didn't <laughs> say their request was reasonable. <laughs> okay. You know, one, one thing that um, might come into consideration is that from Mulberry Street down to Bosey's, you have no access to the rail trail unless you build a bridge. The creek, for yeah. There's no way to get across to the other side unless yeah. you build a bridge. So, what if you only get two connections? No closer than a half a mile apart. Or so we don't end up with two properties apart, next to each other. I think from Philly Pizza out to Bosis is about a mile and a quarter. If that's not even that. Uh, Huguenot is uh, approximately a mile. A mile and a quarter. So just over a mile. So maybe, yeah, you know, three quarters, a mile. I think we can agree that we'll have limited businesses <laughs> and we'll have a discussion with the Rail Trail, the Rail Trail Association. Land Trust, because Land Trust is a conservation agent, the Rail Trail Association manages it. But we need, we need language in this code that Parameters. gives the, the planning board something to work with. I think we're better designating it as a village and then saying that, you know, that we'll provide connections to that access through the stubs, but that, you know, it'll be our choice where they go, not, not the applicant. Instead of first coming. But if but if an applicant wants to build a nice bridge that connects their property and then the stubs have access to that nice bridge, that's what that's should what be we done. <laughs> yeah, that's well, the maybe should I should have uh, an easement to every access point. This way they, it doesn't limit you in the future if somebody wants to close you off to it. 
but we're not going to set up easements. This is a discussion that is actually going on among all the other trails yeah. at the same time. And the city of Kingston is actually putting together a management plan, which they expect to have maybe done by the end of March 2018. And this is exactly the issue that they're facing because how do they deal with it? They've got road crossings where the Kingston Green Line is, and they really emphasize the fact that it's a green passageway that people are going there for something of just not just a connection between different parts of the city of Kingston, but it's also a quiet park like atmosphere. So they're looking at how do we manage that and keep it clean and safe and also preserve something of that quietude that they're in the middle of the city they want. So to encode this into a building code right now actually may limit you in the future if you suddenly say, well, we're going to allow up to two and now you can hold that and fix it. This is a this is a sale point for your for your property. As yes. opposed to being a you know a place for people to go. It is a, it's a it's a, a marvelous thing that right in the village. You're in nature right there. But the problem is if you write code that just says we hope you know the rail trail can be enjoyed. Well don't put it in the code. Well, so in but the you, code, you we'll put that <laughs> well, it, okay, so let's back up. So yeah. it'll say it requires a special use permit. Yeah. That's and the following, I know I'm, I'm just taking a breath. <laughs> not end of sentence. That's my point. Um, I, and I don't know if this is how, but something like with respect to, with consideration, I mean, we could put in consultation with the Volca Valley Rail Trail and with the following considerations. That's the part of the sentence I think we're struggling with figuring out. What are the what are the guidelines for the special use permit? How do you manage that interaction of two different crowds of people will be? What were you gonna suggest, Kara? Well, you know, right now Zero Place is talking about they want access from the back of the building. So that access point would be like maybe at the most 30 feet from, from Mulberry Street. So why is there a need for additional access there? So that's the kind of thing I think we want to try and avoid is those extra access points. So intervals between. Yes. So what do we so that could be one of the parameters. And what do we think is 30 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet? Half a mile. <laughs> yeah, you're looking thousand feet. I mean, you got a mile too, so that's what six thousand feet almost. How many feet would you estimate it is from Mulberry to the existing uh, connection from the net zero? Yeah. Uh, I'd say it's around two hundred feet. Two hundred. I'd say it's two hundred feet. I don't think you would want to go less than two hundred. Yeah. I would say probably our intent to provide one more access point between Tributary 13 and the north, the northern Huguenot Street connection, and that it's our intent to make that a public access point, and uh, well, I don't know how you say this. Maybe the developer can apply to be that public access point based on the needs of the building. But you're just talking about the east side, right? What about the west side? The it's west right side. Right. There, the west is. side's not NBR, so anything that yeah. we're writing here exactly. doesn't matter. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, got it. Got it. Got it. And but the, it seems like if we we're going to do, to, but to Michael's point, if you're really going to do master planning, you have to be mindful of what's permittable on the west side too. But it's not at all. There are no. There but are no permitted accesses. But then there probably are neighbors who have yes, gorilla name. accesses. Yeah. Not very many. No, not many, but there's got to be some. My neighbor has a little thing. I'm not that worried about those, anyways. Well, if we're looking for one more one more connection to that part of the trail, and we do have an easement in place already, wouldn't it make sense to utilize that one? Right well, next I, to I don't know. I, I, I mean, Rich is telling us there's an easement. I've never heard of this. I mean, you yeah, mentioned it. In, uh, I want to say it was in uh, 2015, uh, Joe Ariel was the village um, attorney. And I actually was, had a boat for sale on my front yard. And I got a letter from Ariel that I thought we could get it on. So 
So I did a title search, and it was a judgment and a warning back in the abandonment of Old Kingston Road when they did 32 back in the 30s. And it was a state uh, judgment for the Supreme Court, excuse me, Supreme Court, that abandoned that Old Kingston Road, and they clarified the delineation of the property line. So the village gave me over that. Do you have documentation? You can. Absolutely. All right. So let, let one of you. Yeah, just, just, just get us this documentation. Yeah, That'll help. And then, and that's our, that could be our second connection, and then we're done. We're done. Okay. The, the distance from Mulberry to Thurl uh, Place is about 500 feet, and the distance from Mulberry all the way to Bosey is about 3,500. Yeah. So it's pretty far after that first. Yeah, that's true. Well, but it's actually the closest connection if you're coming down from you know, Montague Drive or Sunset Bridge or Ann Street, it's, it focuses, it kind of funnels all the way there. There's not much else except the village arms. And the Let's take a look at the wall. easement language that you have. Okay. So we want to, we have 10 more minutes before we talk to Russell. Do we want to, do you have a 10 minute topic? No. <laughs> This oh, cool. is something that we started to install on the rail trail. Every half mile, we have a mile marker. And this will give you sort of a sense of the level of access that we actually have on our rail trail right now. This is end to end, 22 miles. Each one of these is one mile. But you know, we sort of laid it out so that we had you know, we have these mile markers that are three and a half inches. That's four by four posts, and we try to figure out what can we inexpensively produce that can help people locate themselves on the rail trail at any point. So um, we just installed just a few of these so far, but this is uh, a north facing, basically. Um, but you can sort of just see this little tiny circle where you are. There's a lot of places to access the rail trail from physical streets. And this is a real challenge to, to, uh, to manage for every community. And unfortunately, we just had the town of Gardner just did all of the street crossings. They just painted crosswalks. We have them here in the village, fortunately. And now we got Rosendale. Oh, come on up, you can see this. Do you know where you go with Anyway, I just thought I would leave this with you now and uh, sort of help you guys uh, think about it in more detail. Cool, thanks, Michael. Yeah, Thank you. Awesome. Good job. All right, so we don't have a 10 minute topic? Um, you can't find something to talk about for 10 minutes? We have so much to get through. I'd hate to just push it aside. Well, I've got north south. Parking. I've got building height design oh, standards. Oh, parking. Why don't we do parking? parking? Because we, because Brad had a, a, a some suggested ratios, and yeah, I, I think those too. ratios. Are, what? I've got one. You've got one. Uh, so where's parking now? Page six. Parking now is one and a half for one bedroom and two for anything above one. All right, I put in here the one that you and Tim were talking about last time. Where is it? Page in the six, middle of page eight, six, right here. Can you say one? Oh, there it is. There it is. Yeah. Got one it. space per one bedroom or studio unit. One and a half per two bedroom unit. Two per unit with three or more bedrooms. Brad, you know what I would add to this is that the building has to have a minimum number of units, right? Because this kind of stuff works when the the building's large enough. I, I think you're right. Which, which we can assume that any building will be large enough, but we should throw in that number for a threshold. Yeah, like you know, know for, for, small parcels. for at least ten units, buildings no. with at least ten units. The only thing I don't think you picked up on was that we talked about not just that, but then an additional one space per ten units for visitors service. Yeah. So it was really one point one for a one bedroom or a studio, 1.6 for a two bedroom, 2.1 for a three bedroom, and we can go on. So a little 10% bump, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with 10 that. 10% bump, just for service visitors. Why don't we, I, um, I think it's smart just because uh, the amount of snow that piles up in bad winters, automatically we lose parking spots in every single parking lot in the village, so having that extra 10%
But again, part of that is a result of what Roddy was saying about, you know, well, I'm just going to put in six bedroom apartments if you're going to live in a maximum of two. So we don't want that. So, no. you know, we yeah, do want Yeah, I thought that was really important when he said you, you hit a yeah. certain point where you're going to actually attract what you don't want. Yeah, exactly. So Tim, what uh, you Which suggest is why we I do would for when there's less than 10 units? Yeah, we need a little more parking. You need, you need, you know, it's, yeah. So it's always, even if there's one unit, you still have to have that one visitor parking space. And if you have 11 that? units, you have to have two. And commercial is clear. Commercial is a separate one. Well, yeah, that's one at a time. And commercial is a little bit more. So what do you, Dennis, do you All have right, an so idea for less? No, I was just curious what you were thinking. Minutes. What were you thinking? Go. For commercial or no, let's stay with the uh, residential. Well, I like the idea of <clears throat> if there's 10 or more units, for each 10 units you have an additional spot. I think that's a good idea. I don't even think it's actually 10 Well, you either do it that way or units. you build it into the original map. It's five units. It's you not know, The 10. more I thought about it, I think you're right. I it's think, five. you know, so it's 1.2 okay. for one bedroom apartment, right? That's what you meant, right? In other words, for every five units, you have to have an additional space. Is that what you meant? No, I was thinking that this idea of like, these ratios work if you have a building with five or more units. Oh. But if you had, let's say you had a building that was a four unit building, these ratios uh, don't provide enough parking. You're saying you need more so when it's have, smaller? Yeah, so if you have fewer, if you have just what's the rationale to that? Just so so so. Let's say you had four a four unit building with four studio apartments. Mm -hmm. Then you only have four parking spots. That's too few. You need well, you need you like need five, six or five. One, so you got five. Okay. So, so then, are we saying we don't need a X units or more, or? No, I'm saying you, you, go, you go up every, you go up a half space for every bedroom. I thought we were creating rules for X or less or X or more, but you're abandoning well, maybe that? Maybe we're moving away from that. Okay. Okay. So this is what we have, Brad. We have 1.1 space per one bedroom or studio, 1.6 spaces per two bedroom. 2.1 spaces per unit with three or more bedrooms. I said three bedrooms, and then I was going up still. Because of what Roddy said, Two I spaces. still want to go up for a half space for every additional bedroom. So if you come in with a four bedroom apartment, yeah. then you need half for the unit, half for each bedroom, plus the ten. Plus the so what is that? Ten. It's uh, a four. Math used to be good at uh, a four bedroom car would be two point six. Okay. Can I get those numbers again? One point one. One point five. Two point one. No, I think it's one point six. It wasn't it six number. No, one point one, one for a one bedroom or a studio. Yeah, sorry, you're, you're right. Uh, one point six for two. Two, two bedroom. Two point one for a three bedroom. An additional point five for each additional bedroom. That way we don't have to uh, stay up to okay. okay. ten. You know, you keep scaling it up. Okay. I think it's more than we need, but nobody else does. Yeah. Well, well in just, this I, area, I'm not signing off on this yet. I okay. just think this is kind of the, the the framework we should sleep on. Okay. Yeah. yeah no, I like the framework. Mm -hmm. I'm down with the framework. I know Russell. You're gonna get mad at me if I slip up at 6:30. So we've got three minutes. We have one minute. I'm sleeping over here. <laughs> Go ahead, Sam. Last question. I'm wondering about like what if a couple are in a one bedroom and they have two cars? Like, I think the idea is it'll balance out with someone else out. that has two bedrooms where they have children in the other bedroom and they only have one car for two bedrooms. Because if we build every look at all the spots that it's a couple and a kid. Still two cars. Yeah, I know, but if you build if you build to that standard, then you're then you get Mulberry Square that's Mulberry. empty all the time. You end up with way too much parking. Yeah, and try to figure out wrap my head around why. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's tricky. People who live I live with just one car or one one adult. Why is based on the pedestrian 
by, uh, by some nature of the community, right. it should lower the demand. You know? right. That was the original thinking. That's the, the whole raise off that. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's But to your point, Donna, worst case scenario is you have a two bedroom apartment and you have a couple in each apartment, and each one of those people has a car. You could potentially have four cars for a two bedroom apartment. So. That's why this is very tricky. I don't think anybody wants uh, expansive parking lots, but there's given there's no public parking in that area at all, we have to make sure that we don't undershoot the number. So, all right, so let we have a framework. Let's sleep on it, yep. and then we'll come back. Sounds great. So, do we want to jump into having good work? Are we joining us? our workshop? Nope. No, this We're is the same the meeting. Oh, I see. Same thing. Okay. So, Topic number two. two. Yeah, we didn't get through our list. Uh, well, reason, we might be able to fit it in our regular meeting. Workshop, um, but but workshops are the same as regular meetings. They have the same legal standing. The the only reason that we're doing a workshop as opposed to during a meeting is we have 20 agenda items at our meeting. My brain is so mushy during those meetings. Like someone wants to talk to me about NBR and parking ratios, I, I can't follow. Like we need to do it in this kind of like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there. I think right. it's safe we're going to talk about it. It's, it's safe to assume that we will have another meeting where we dedicate more than just ten minutes to the NBR. And we're talking Probably about just using one. our yeah. third Wednesday is always for workshops, and it's, I mean it's sort of fallen out of habit. But if you think about village boards of of the past, like that was a regular thing, the third Wednesday. Yeah, in between our second and fourth, which is our regular meetings. But um, yeah, we'll let you know. We're just trying to keep the ball rolling here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. Good job, guys. Thanks, Brad. to get your Yeah, talk about code something or other. I got the old one. It's a thank you note from Resistorhood for getting tampons from us. Good. Okay, let's talk about water. All right, you want to sit down with us, Russell? Sure. Hi, thanks for coming. Are you looking for somebody? Paul again. Hi, Russell, how are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Did you eat at Mahmoud's oh, when you're in New Haven? I'm sorry? Did you eat at Mahmoud's when you're in New Haven? Let's see, where, when we were at um, sorry. You, we all the way Tommy 2 has closed. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's a shame. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter always ate at Mahmoud's. We were just there a couple weeks ago. Yeah. We took the kids there. We're picking up Charlie on Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Okay, so we're we're still live in a regular business meeting where regular village business can be conducted. Um, we have um, worked with Russell Overmead from Chazen on a few different projects where we're looking for groundwater wells up at the um, water treatment plant, and we've also been exploring the possibility of. Uh, drilling wells in the municipally owned pieces of property, Hasbro Park and Moriello Pool Park. Um, so Russell thought it made sense to sit with the board and you know talk about where we've drilled some holes, where we are still looking to drill some holes, um, and just kind of open it up to, to, to questions. Because um, you know we're trying to take a long approach to this. Uh, you know the, the real goal here is to buy less water from the DEP. You know, that would be a, a boon to our our water fund, which last year was budgeted at $1.6 million. So every 100,000, or 100 gallons per minute that we can source locally versus buying from the DEP 
saves that $1.6 million fund $100,000 a year. So with that, um, you want to just give us a quick summary of where we've drilled so far, what we're looking at, uh, the conversation you and I had with Shelly Mertens at the Department of Health yesterday. I'd be happy to do that. Thanks for the opportunity to come in. I've, I've heard repeatedly that this topic is discussed at this board and uh, to the point where my photograph has been put on podiums and uh, such. So it's nice to be here to be able to answer questions uh, directly. Uh, is is uh, Trustee Kerr coming back? We don't know. We don't know. Okay. Don't know. All right. Um, so I, I resonate with everything you said. It's a good summary. Um, and uh, at the risk of repeating things that you guys know, let me just walk through what we've done from my perspective. Um, and please jump in wherever you'd like. Um, but uh, the, the first assignment we got was to look at the uh, reservoir property. Um, and your prior consultant had identified four prospective locations on, on, the, uh, on the basis of their geologic assessment of the site. Uh, those four sites all looked reasonable to me. I added two um, that, that, that I, th I thought were also promising. Um, one of the four was, had been drilled before we were engaged uh, and produced uh, a, a better than average yield, which you know, validates sort of this, the, the linear feature approach that both firms tend to use. Um, uh, estimated at around at the time around 30 gallons a minute. Um, and uh, the hole that you then invested in uh, in, the, in the pistol range location um, looked like it was going to be much more than that, uh, which, which was exciting. Uh, but as I always caution people, rock wells, um, you, can have a, you can have a very good fracture, um, but it's, as, it's only going to be as productive as the secondary fractures replenish it as you proceed with long-term use. So where you start and where you end after uh, stressing um, a well with an extended test is really the more interesting number. Uh, so we were happy to work with Jim Wilde, who you, many of you have um, a good comfort level with and whom I'm enjoying working with and getting to know because I've often worked with other drillers. Uh, helped us set up for a 72-hour pumping test, which is the test of duration that uh, Health Department and, and I over the years have come to believe is long enough to kind of stress an aquifer that weaknesses reveal themselves and you, and you start to learn what the quality and the long-term capacity is going to be. Um, and, and neither well performed as well as it initially pro uh, provided source, but collectively pr they produced 50 gallons a minute. Um, and uh, we're, I'd say we were pretty happy with that outcome. Um, and uh, it's halfway to the 100,000 uh, uh, number that, or the 100 gallon a minute number that you just mentioned, Tim. Um, so the questions are where to drill next, um, and that's been subject to. I wanted to before we yep. jump on to where to drill next, because you you had an interesting conversation with some of the uh, regulators in terms of what they would permit us to withdraw and this idea of a seasonal yep. withdrawal level I think was really interesting because you know this is good point so should I summarize it? on that no, a little let, bit let me summarize it um, you know many times many times um, a water investigation is seeking to reach a certain threshold yield so that program can be built we need 50 gallons a minute because we have 100 houses proposed. We need 25 gallons a minute because something. And so if you don't hit that goal, the test is, is not successful because it's being, it, it is linked to a proposed uh, use. But in this instance, you are looking for water that could simply replace other water that is already guaranteed to you. Um, and so as we were watching this test unfold, I thought to myself, well, it's, it's late summer. This is the time of the year when aquifers are, are, are productive, but not at their peak productivity. Um, would, it, it seems a shame that if this 50 gallon a minute yield from two wells, um, 
if those two welds could collectively produce 70 or 80 gallons a minute during a wetter time of year, what would be the harm in, in, in taking that during wetter periods? And so I called um, Jim Gary, who is a, a very good hydrogeologist who works at Central Office DEC, uh, and started the conversation with him. Uh, it would be an unusual permit, because typically the permit says, well, the 72-hour test shows that under somewhat stress conditions, it's a 50 gallon a minute collection of yields, that's going to be your allowance. And I started a conversation with him that says, well, what happens if instead we, we try to explore a permit that says you won't pump it down below a certain point, but that if during a wetter period you could, that gives you more and during a drier period it gives you less, you, it, might be a net, it might be a net plus. Um, and he said, well, in this circumstance, um, that would be something that the DEC would be willing to consider. Um, the second half of every permit like this it comes from the health department. Is this similar to what they've done? Like, I think you brought that to my attention, that Ramapo River, where there's like a seasonal yield, so when it's wetter, because the, the, the concern is that if there's a, a communication between the yes. groundwater well and the surface water, that you only want to pump it when you're not potentially going to harm the surface water. So it's the same concept. Where you, you, you can pump it harder during wetter periods. It's similar in that it's a conditional yield. Yeah. Uh, it's for a very different reason. Um, the, the situation in Ramapo uh, is to preserve a minimum flow in that river. And because there's a, a known hydraulic connection between that well field and that river, uh, when the, the flow in the river drops below a certain point, uh, they want to make sure that the pumping is curtailed to preserve flow in the river. Um, but you make the good point that there's a, predic there's a, a precedent for, uh, for a permit that um, is not centered on a particular number. Um, so I'm encouraged about that on your behalf. Uh, I'm glad I asked. Um, and, uh, and when we had a conceptual conversation about that with Shelley Mertens uh, at Ulster County Health Department just the other day, she seemed open to it and she deferred it to her central office and we have not heard back. Um, but the fact that she was open to it, the fact that I know that she and central office have respect for Jim Gary and, you know, as their counterparts in DC, I, I, I'm optimistic. So this may be, um, these two wells may receive what in other circumstances would be an unconventional permit that says uh, we're not going to put a particular number on it. We think it's somewhere between maybe during a drought, 35 gallons a minute and up to as much as it can produce during a very wet period, as long as you don't pump it down. Um, and let me just diverge for a moment. Um, one of my preferences when we manage a well field um, is that I don't like, I, I, I think that the longevity of a well is harmed if you dewater fractures. So if you pump down too low, then the upper fractures that allow water to cascade into the well, if they become dewatered, then oxygen enters them, and then you get mineralization, and then over time you lose yield. So if this <coughs> conversation goes forward, the conversation I would have with my hydrogeology counterpart at DEC is, what would that set point be? So you're talking about where you set the pump? Where we set the pump, correct. And where we would set the pump, or if not the pump, at least a, 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 um, a float switch that would turn the, the pump on and off. Uh, would be set in the vicinity of the uppermost fractures so that the water level would be drawn down to those fractures but all at all times water would continue to flow in through those fractures into the well and at no point would they become evacuated because that's what contributes to their long term you know so it wouldn't require manual monitoring there's an actual switch on the pump correct so that way as the water this would be absolutely this is this will not be uh, they're just trying to think about how labor intensive it is. Right, well, and, and the easiest exciting. way to do it, as Tim jumped to the, the, the right conclusion, um, is you could just set the pump at that level, then it would be impossible to pump it any lower. Oh, right. So that, that would one, be one way to do it. The other way to do it um, would be to have a float. Um, so the, and, and I don't have an engineering co partner here who would do that design, um, but uh, that, that one would work that out. It's still a creative way to get more yield out of it when we have yes. the potential. Yes, so thank you um, for reminding me that that's um, an idea that we brought to the table. DEC seems open to, and health department seems at a preliminary yeah, that level. Yeah, that seems very promising. It so squeeze out a few more yes. GPM. Yep. So it, it, if in late summer these two wells produce 50 gallons a minute, I, I don't see any reason why in March 
you know, or any typical wet month, you wouldn't be getting at least a couple tens of gallons more than that out of these two. So you guys want to move on to where else we're looking? Do you want to stick with uh, water Well, let's treatment? finish the there reservoir from water. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yep. Are there are spots we're looking yep. at the water treatment exactly. plant property. So at the water treatment property or the reservoir property, as I've been calling it, and I'll go with whatever vocabulary you prefer, there are two other locations we've been looking at. Um, my preferred next location, and I've, I, 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 I'm grateful that the mayor in blue and others have allowed me to look at it, is, is very close to the existing water plant. Um, it uh, is on what I consider to be the second dominant linear feature on the site. By linear feature, I mean increase in the landscape that at depth may have fractures or may not. I don't make the geology, but the crease in the landscape suggests that there's weakness, and weakness is where there may be fractures. Um, we weren't able to put the first hole right on that linear feature because there are, are utilities. Um, and so we, but, and that's fine with me because whatever's happening at grade, you know, I don't know what direction uh, what fractures at depth are going. So if they're going to one direction, if you drill to one side, you may pick them up anyway. And if you go to the other side, you pick up things on the other side. So I'm, I'm always comfortable drilling on one side or the other. We did drill on the west side of that linear feature, very close to the water plant. Um, and I guess I'd say we got a base hit. Um, 18 gallons a minute isn't terrible. It's certainly better than your average well. Um, but it's probably not what you want uh, if you're going to equip it and plumb it and permit it and all that. And it certainly hasn't been, it hasn't been run through a 72-hour pump test. Um, and so 18 gallons a minute as sort of a first yield might drop back to 10 to 15. So that, that was in a sense disappointing, but it, to me it also validated that it's a location that at least is more fractured than average. Um, and uh, uh, in instances like this, I feel like I'm a sports coach. You know, you play the hand you have and you put the best player you can on the field. And, uh, but I don't make the player in the same way that I don't make the geology. Um, so um, we're in discussion um, whether to make an, a, sec a second uh, uh, drilling attempt in that location on the other side of the same linear feature. So if, if the fractures are dipping one direction, we've plumbed this location. We did hit a pretty a decent fractured zone at 270 feet. So one could, one the negative scenario is that is the direction of the fracture and that's all we're gonna get. The other is that that was another more minor fracture from somewhere else and if we drill on the other side, we might pick up something more productive. It's a complicated location because it's right on the edge of your uh, dominant reservoir, reservoir four. And so, um, Certainly cuttings and fluid can't be allowed to flow into the reservoir. So um, managing that is something that we've spent some time thinking about. And I think uh, uh, in conversation, um, when and how to do that uh, is still in play. There is a, a so that would be a second, uh, a, that would be a second hole attempted along that particular linear feature. It's a linear feature I like. Um, um, and, um, you know, a decision needs to be made. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's so a then our next step there, though, is we're talking to Blue, because Blue had some concerns about how we deal with the cuttings. And, yes. And uh, Bill was up there that day, and, and, and I think maybe even after you left, we came up with another spot, which, which might even be better, but now Blue wants to review that again. So we'll talk with Blue. And that's that. all fine. I mean, this, yep. this is where the hydrogeology first wishes intersects with reality on the ground, and, um, and we do what we can. Uh, we've also been talking with Red Truth because uh, we're also at, right by the, uh, the water plant, and there are health department required setbacks from various you know, kinds of things, and so Rich, I think, has assured us that everything there meets those setbacks, but you know, those, the, the, that's where it's always nice to have an engineering counterpart on these kind of decisions. So that's been great to have his input. Um, the next location on the same property uh, is one of the original four locations identified by, by, by Alpha. Um, and it's in the ravine that is below um, Reservoir 3. It's a little difficult to get to. You've, auth you've authorized funds to uh, get the drill rig in there and, um, and put a hole in there. Um, I'm supportive of that. I don't disagree with the location. I appreciate that you've given me a shot at the two locations that I had recommended. Um, and um, and we, so we got a price from Jim Wild to prepare uh, an access route to that location. 
and Blue said that the, the price that he it's a very good price really it's really it's super it's a very reasonable price given given the the uh, limited but yeah. but necessary uh, sort of work that is needed to get uh, two two fairly large vehicles into that location and then I've had conversations with the Mohawk Preserve because it seems like there's an advantage to drilling 100 feet from the preserve property line so normally you need 100 foot of ownership plus an additional 100 feet of control so normally you'd want to be 200 feet off the property line but, but that puts us off the, the linear feature. Yeah, so the, the linear, linear feature, feature <laughs> seems most attractive if we're only 100 feet off the property line. But because the preserve has all of these restrictions and, and all this documentation that, that the executive director at the preserve, Glenn Hoagland, has shared with me, and I've explained to him why it would be advantageous for us to drill only 100 feet off their property, um, he seems comfortable with it. It's something he needs to run by his board but um, the DOH seems like they could become comfortable with it as well. Like they basically just need an assurance that the Mohonk Preserve is not going to develop right. that area. And you know, it's a ridiculously steep slope and it's the Mohonk Preserve. So I, I think the DOH could get comfortable pretty quickly with the idea that they're not going to put in a septic system on that uh, part, part of their parcel. How, how, how long might this road be, this access road be, into that? <coughs> it's what, less than 100 feet. They're just basically yeah, I, going, there's kind of, you can see that there was some sort of old road there, right. and road then they're just gonna cut down into the area. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two thirds of the, of the, the distance is, is a, a, a former grade. And then yeah. the last piece is just dropping down. If you to want to wash it, I'll walk. I'll no, walk no, I'm just curious in terms of pumping up and what you get to disturb. Yeah. And so. It's uh, really beautiful. It's a really beautiful spot. It's exactly where you want to get your water from. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I want to get water from a beautiful parcel, so it, it's more likely to pee clean it, and it, safe it, it as is, opposed to it, it's near a, the throughway. It's a wonderful yeah. wooded section. Yes, exactly right. It is not a throughway, but it's, it's right. perfect in that regard. Um, and, and let's just take the moment for me to to, to build on what you're talking about, 100 and, 100 and 200 foot, because it's going to come up when we move to the next sites. Health department requires 100 foot of ownership around a community water system well. And these are community water system wells, or would be if they, if they provide it. If they're successful and connected in because they serve a community they're different from a non-community which tends to sort of serve as a school or a gas station or something like that the definition of community means people go home to live and rely on this source of water for their home so a community water system well needs to have 100 foot of ownership and then the next 100 foot in other words out to 200 feet you have to have control so that allows you sometimes to put a well within 100 feet of a property line as long as the next 200, the owner of that one will, will, um, will usually put a no-build easement or something like that on the, the arc of that next 100 foot. And so really the only question at hand here is if a well that is drilled and turns out to be successful um, is the required 100 feet from the property line Will the health department require that a, a 200 foot arc and an easement be negotiated with Mohonk Preserve or will they simply say Mohonk Preserve already has such extensive protections applied to it we're going to waive the requirement for what is effectively uh, a, a bookkeeping task to put an easement on a corner of the property that presumably they would allow us to do but always has a cost and a burden it's just something it'd be nice if we could sidestep it. So that's part, that was and, and, but the, the issue of the 100 foot ownership and 200 foot of control is, is going gonna, is gonna to be something I'm going to talk about when we move on to the next properties. So um, just for context, the, you know, the, res the reservoir site is uh, two thirds if not more of the elevation rise between the Walco River and the crest of the, the mountain ridge up there. And so um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of bringing me a location and saying making water on it, 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 it wouldn't have been high on my list. Because you know, the higher you are in the watershed, the less watershed you have above you to allow recharge and provide groundwater that is migrating towards your wells. So I've been really quite encouraged that by the results that, that, that have already been identified. Um, and um, and I, you know, 
it is reasonable given the location so high in the watershed um, that during the bottom of a drought, these two wells probably wouldn't even produce 50 gallons a minute. But during typical times, they'll do 50, and during a wet period of time, they'll do more. Um, yields tend to be more stable as you're lower in the watershed because there's just an, an enormous amount of up, uphill watershed through which water is migrating, good times or bads, and, and stabilizing the yield of wells. So um, that's my sense on the reservoir. Uh, you guys have been not battering me with any questions. Well, I, just a quick question. Yep. Potentially, in terms of gallons per minute, might we produce that water treatment plant, do you think? I mean, now we're about 70, 85, at least in our conversations. During a wet period, yes. During a wet period. I think, you know, Potentially, I, have, I have been hopeful that, um, I have been hopeful that location six, which is just because we numbered these locations, um, location six, which is by the water plant, I've been hopeful that it, it, in theory, it ought to be able to produce another 30 to 40 gallons. Really? Yeah. The question, because it's on a different linear feature, it's draining a different part of the hillside. Whether there's a fracture there and whether we can find it is the second part of the, the challenge. But, but to do something like that, that's why I've been keen to give it a second shot at least. Okay, so water treatment plant potentially could produce 100 to 125 gallons per minute. The whole parcel. During the wet. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Which is part of the, and so, so to back up a minute, that's part of the reason that we've been talking to DEC at all. Because the way water supply permits are administered these days is that the DEC does not need to review permits for any location that produces less than 100,000 gallons a day, which is give or take 70 gallons a minute. But because I was reasonably optimistic that collectively on this piece of yeah. property you might get over 70, we engaged with not only the health department, right. but right. with DEC sure. in advance of the investigation um, because it's nice to have their buy-in, it's nice to get their review of test protocols, it's nice to just keep them involved in the conversation because ultimately if we get over 70 gallons a minute, we're going to be going to both agencies saying, DEC, do you agree that the ecology and the stream vitality and the valley can sustain a withdrawal of 70 plus gallons a minute and health department since it's being served to the public do you agree that it's potable and that it's reliable and so that's why both of them are engaged it's why DEC some years ago decided to stop reviewing permits under 70 gallons a minute because they they found themselves reviewing lots and lots of permits for what are what were in their eyes sort of somewhat de minimis from an ecological perspective withdrawals and what impact, and it's certainly going to be asked in terms of any yep. neighboring wells, down, down slope, up slope? So there will be no impact up slope because those residents get the water first. Um, and, and so uh, you know, the, the, if, if groundwater migrating toward the wall kill down slope of upgrading wells <coughs> is captured and served to the people in the village, um, the upslope wells will not notice or experience it. Um, it will be appropriate, uh, particularly, so let me tell you that when we tested, when we ran the test at, um, uh, that, that was the two wells near um, Reservoir 3, uh, it was my opinion that we were likely, unlikely to have any uh, influence on the nearest domestic well, which was the, the property that's immediately downhill from the um, Reservoir 4. So we put a monitoring device but in. We put a monitoring device in anyway. Okay. And we, we, proved, we, proved the tr we proved what my guess had been, but data are better than no data. And so we have, we have ample evidence that uh, use of the two wells by Reservoir 3 has no impact on the nearest domestic well. So that's for wells one and five. Right. Correct. And we tested the neighbor. And then, but if we, so we've drilled at site six, which is right next to the plant. And then if we do a second number six, I'll call it six B. Yep. If we do six B, then and the if homes that are across the street we would on Mountain West them. Road, we should monitor them if it seems like it's worth doing a 72 hour pump right. test on six B. Your mayor is very quickly becoming an accomplished hydrogeologist. <laughs> Which is good. Thank you. Um, smiling at you since the microphone can't tell these things. Um, so um, the um, and and that that would be the right thing to do. Um, so let me diverge for just a moment, saying there there is nothing wrong with having an influence on other existing wells. The question is degree. 
right? We, we've had many wells permitted that um, provided some new applicant a certain amount of water and produced some influence on nearby wells. But if that influence is less than and leaves a plenty of water column in place for that other well to continue functioning within the DEC and the DOH, those are perfectly acceptable influences. So we're not looking for zero influence in a situation like that. We're looking for acceptable influence. And just a quick ballpark. Do you know the nearest wells, the depth of those wells for the domestics? The nearest. What was the depth of the neighbor? The neighbor. Oh, this the is, the, 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 I, my deep. recollection is that their well was about 150 feet deep. 150 yeah, it was yeah, not too deep. Not, not too deep. So and we're Correct. thinking about going. Well, we never go more than 500. I see. Okay. All right. Right. I yeah. mean, that's kind of the rule of thumb is that a bedrock well, you're going to find what you're looking for between you know, 100 and 500. Right? If, if money were no object, uh, one could keep drilling deeper. Uh, we've put in a very successful well in the town of Southeast that's 800 feet deep and it produces 100 plus gallons a minute and it hit all its water at 800 feet. Okay. That's when we stopped drilling. But I thought but we're generally not doing that. Typically we do not. Typically we do not. Particularly not in these shales. That was a different formation there. Um, and uh, you know where you, you go to great, great, great depth when you have no choice left. This project is going to be built, or it's not going to be built, and this is your one spot. Then you drill to China. So um, that might happen, right, with a private home. Like, so correct. you have a house, you need five GPM right. to to live, but and you can't find it at five hundred. <laughs> so your only choice is to, to keep just keep digging. going. Yeah. <clears throat> well, in this case, drilling because drilling. We try not to put somebody down the hole with a shovel. But in any case, <laughs> um, but um, the uh, yeah. So. In this instance, I'm, I'm really comfortable with 500 as a number. Um, certainly the work we've d done looking at wells statistically is as you go deeper than four to 500 feet, your, your likelihood of a good in, getting a good strike is reduced, particularly in shale because the weight of the rock just sort of squeezes the somewhat ductile rock closed. All right, so that's the reservoir. Um, as you know, we also we looked briefly at a piece of property midway down the hill, um, the, pr the privately owned property. Um, there's, and I'm, the name is escaping me. Palmatier property. Palmatier. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, prom the property actually looks promising from a hydrogeologic perspective. There's some access issues and some wetland issues, and then there were some um, property concern issues, and so for the moment that's on hold, but just you know, to acknowledge that we've spent some time there. Um, the, the next two properties, um, one is Hasbrook Park, the other is um, Moriello Park. Um, and Hasbrook Park, I think, is easily summarized um, as an opportunity. Uh, from a geologic perspective, it's pretty flat. It does not appear to have any linear features going right through the middle of it. It is surrounded by modest linear features. And, any, and once again, when I use linear features, I'm hedging my bets. I'm saying I'm not sure it's a fracture. There is something going on that is making the landscapes crease. Typically, that suggests that there's weakness in rock because that you know a, a crease in the landscape is, has become a point of weakness over time where erosion and weathering can take out rock. So when we look at it over time, we say that's probably not there. By dumb luck, it's probably there because it was vulnerable to erosion and therefore it could be a linear feature. From there, then if it is a fracture, is it dipping to the east or the west, north, south? Um, so I'm not, I'm not opposed to um, a test, a well drilled at Hasbro Park from a hydrogeologic uh, perspective. I, I don't rank it higher than your other locations. Um, it has a number of logistical challenges, some of which we have discussed with um, the health department, um, and we don't have an answer given the the public uses that are that are enjoyed at Hasbrook Park. We presume that the well should be finished below grade, um, so that people can continue to use the the land uh, for various uses. That's an unconventional way for a community water system well to be finished. Um, I note, brought to their attention that there are wells finished below grade in the town of Bethlehem that function perfectly nicely. I'm familiar with them. They're finished in vaults. Um, and uh, so I, I, I have raised that <coughs> example. 
uh, with Shelley, she's talking about it with central office. I'm assuming that you would not want to proceed unless there is some agreement from the health department that a below grade finish would be allowed. Shelley said that to her knowledge, Ulster County has never, never approved a below grade finish. So we don't know where that's going to go. The second set of complications um, for Hasbro parking get, get us back to our, our 100 and 200 foot issues. The property is roughly square. Um, it is roughly 400 by 500. So if we were going to set back 200 from property lines, we're putting one well right in the dead center of this park. Um, the only other direction that we could go um, is in the direction of this parking lot, which is owned by the village, because that means the village, the village in fact owns land on both sides of the road. And so the question to the health department is, and the village owns the road. So does that constitute ownership in the way that one could potentially put a second drilling attempt a little bit further north? Or not a second drilling attempt, but a first drilling attempt first. First or a second, yes. Oh, but so you're thinking your first attempt would just be dead in the middle of the park anyways? And if you didn't find it, you I haven't would even, consider I haven't, a second? I haven't, I haven't even ranked them. I'm just saying there's the potential for more than one location. Um, huh. Yeah. But you're also, it feels like, uh, if you're I was, lukewarm at best on this property. Um, if I was going to rank them, I would have said that the a little bit further north was better because it's closer to where there's the spring and Peace Park uh -huh. um, and things like that. So uh, if I had to if I had to rank them, I, I think neither are as promising as, uh, as locations that have a more discreet sort of evidence of, of rock weakness. Russell, yep. putting everything below grade, does that increase the expense significantly? <laughs> um, all things considered, negligible. Okay. Right? I mean, engineering costs and connection costs and disinfection and feeding it in versus whether it's got to stick up and it's in, or in a vault, it's in the de minimis category. No, thank you. Yeah. Organization. Yeah, it will cost something. It, it'll it will cost, some, it'll something cost something more.